Welcome back. So now we are going to discuss about the staining methods uh, in this presentation. So basically the staining term uh, as you can recollect gives you the contrast of the molecule that you are talking about. So though we discussed about the staining at several places um, in our earlier discussion, let's consolidate them again and see um, how exactly the staining works, what are the requirements, what are the materials available and what are the precautions to be taken. So let's move so let's see the stains stains um, as we always see it has two options for the optical microscopy and electron microscopy so let's start with how the um, stain works in the optical microscopy so shown here are some of the stains here the ethidium bromide the safranin and the DAPI. So ethidium bromide, as all you know, it is um, known for staining or just uh, um, uh, interacting with the nucleic acid. The safranin will go and bind to the um, nucleus in a cell. cell. And DAPI again is known to for uh, bind with the nucleic acid. So shown here are three stains that are specifically meant for um, binding at the nucleic acid. And um, of course, these are all like a fluorescent labels, and these find their application especially in the fluorescent microscopy. And shown here, not shown here is the um, cumacy blue, which is um, well familiar to everyone. And cumacy blue is known majorly to the protein. So that means we have two molecules uh, are two categories of molecules which can selectively bind either to a nucleic acid or to a protein so by the presence of this stain we can sense that whether the molecule is present or not so this is what we call as a positive stain and having two categories or specificity of the um, binding of the stain molecule we can also call this as a differential staining so that means in case if you have like a two mixed stains together by uh, looking at the place where are the fluorescent you can just detect um, two distinct molecules and so let it be nucleic acid or the protein uh, in a clear um, way so coming back to the electron microscope electron microscope the stains work in entirely different direction and this is what we call as a negative stain so recollect what we have discussed in the optical microscope or the fluorescent microscope is a positive stain where the stain molecule ha will have the interaction with the molecule of your choice and in the case of electron microscope the stain will go and just interact or stain the background of the uh, molecule so this is why the stain in the electron microscope is called a negative stain so as you can see we have several molecules available or several chemicals available for staining it one is the uranyl acetate sodium tungstate lead citrate and ammonium molybdate so these are only four categories i mean four chemicals that i have listed apart from this we have like a huge collection of um, stain molecules available for electron microscope experiment but what is common in all these stain molecules is look at this we have uranium here we have tungsten here we have lead here and we have molybdenum here the one thing that is common with uranium tungsten lead and molybdenum is the um, number of electrons these are all heavy metals and the number of electrons present is more and having more number of electrons they have like a good scattering coefficient compared to the protein and um, having good scattering coefficient they can deviate the path of the electron coming from the gain and thereby can give us a better contrast so this is the um, simple phenomena behind using the um, stain for the electron microscope so what is common here is the heavy metal so few things are worth to discuss about this so the uranium especially the uranyl acetate is um, known as the universal um, stain molecule so that means most of the electron microscope experiment will be done with the uranyl acetate then um, it is worth to discuss about the uranyl acetate for a while let us look at the uranium the word uranium is a little alarming to us because in earlier classes we studied that the uranium is known for the radioactivity so stay away from that fear because the uranium that is used here is classified as what is called a depleted uranium 
what's a depleted uranium a depleted uranium is the one which lost all its radioactivity so you all know that the uranium or any um, radioactive material will have a half-life period so that means its activity reduces to half after the period what is called as a half-life period so that means over several half-life cycles the radioactive material will have the radioactivity um, brought down to the background levels or negligible levels so this is one such uranium which lost all its activity will be used for um, um, the formation of the uranium acetate so as much as the radiation is concerned uranium acetate is safe to um, just handle with so that means you don't need to follow the um, regular safe um, radiation safety unless your local authorities insist on but um, the being a heavy metal still it poses the danger of um, health hazard so you have to handle this uranium acetate um, following the same treatment as you do for heavy metals or any other biological hazards so what is the procedure to do excess of uranium acetate has to be just blotted out with a paper and that paper has to be disposed of in um, regular hazardous materials it should never be dumped into the sink so this is the message that one has to carry on this is not necessarily or limited to the uranium acetate it can also be extended for other strain molecules because the tungsten the lead and molybdenum we all know that these are all also heavy metals and can pose the same damage as the uranium acetate can do so whatever the stain that you are going to use it has to be disposed of using um, the standard protocols or following the standard hazardous uh, materials now here in electron microscope also we have like a two kinds of stains one is a positive stain the other one is a negative stain the word positive stains indicates that your molecule or the stain molecule will go and just um, attach to the biological molecule of your choice and negative stain indicates that your stain molecule will stain the background of it that means everywhere else except your biological molecule so both of things are possible and they are observed in um, routinely in electron microscope experiment but usually people will identify the places where the negative stain um, is dominant so even though the positive stain does or gives the same effect as the negative stain for some reason people are comfortable with the negative stain so that's why most of the electron microscopies they look for the places where the negative stain is observed rather than the positive stain so having said about all the stain molecules let's move on what exactly the positive stain and negative stain shown here is two cases where the positive stain and negative stain is um, can be explained so let us see let's see the boundary that you are seeing um, assume that as a biological molecule um, bear with me it is not resembling any of the protein that you are seeing just imagine your protein looks like this so what is the striking difference between these two is here in the case of positive stain your stain molecules what you are showing here like a scene here as the spherical molecules your stain molecules so the one that is shown as the background is your biological molecule and the spherical molecule that you are seeing is a stain molecule so in a positive stain what happens is for some reason instead of spreading the um, uh, instead of the stain molecule spreading or staining the background of it it just sticks on to the surface of the biological molecule thereby giving or not allowing the proteins to pass through, the electrons to pass through in the case of negative stain what happens is the background is stained and your molecule looks like a transparent to uh, your electrons so that's between a positive stain and negative stain so now let us look at the contrast generated by the molecule the biological molecule and the stain molecule so as you can see here the biological molecule is poor in electrons because um, as we listed before the major constituent of the biological molecule is carbon hydrogen oxygen nitrogen phosphorus and so on all together are considered as light elements compared to the stain molecules let us take the uranyl acetate the atom atomic number of uranyl acetate or the uranium is much much higher than all the constituent molecules put together so that's why the uranium is capable of giving a more scattering or scatter can give us a greater greater scattering to the electrons rather than the molecule 
so that means the electrons cannot pass through this and the electrons can pass through only in the place where the molecule is present so that means um, just looking at a screen downstairs i mean the, uh, at the bottom the fluorescent screen will receive the electron in the place where the protein is present so that means that will be lit green and the places where the biologic the stain molecules is present the electrons are not allowed to pass through and that place looks like a dark so that means the molecule here the biological molecule looks like a bright here whereas the background looks dark whereas let's look at the positive staining now there is um, a transparent like no material is available in the background so electrons go um, uninterrupted and that will be looking like a bright in the fluorescent screen and whereas in the molecule because the electrons are scattered away no electrons will pass through the molecule so that means you can um, expect to see a dark in the fluorescent screen so now look at this the negative stain gives us a bright image and the positive stain give us a black image or the contrast is dark in the case of the positive stain so maybe i can say there is a phase inversal or phase reversal when you move from positive stain to the negative stain negative stain gives us bright for or the white for the protein and the positive stain gives us the black for the protein so that's the difference between positive stain and negative stain then the question arises when do we exactly see the positive stain and when do we exactly and when do we see the positive stain and when do we see the negative stain so the um, understanding of the phenomena of the positive and negative staining is um, sad to say is poorly understood and what you have to do is you have to just look at the entire grid and scan through and identify the places where the negative staining is present so um, my experience is it is not possible um, to say that this stain, this grid is positive stain because in, in the same grid at some places you can um, see the positive staining at some other places you can see the negative staining so that means um, still there is no proper way of understanding the positive staining and negative staining anyway our concern is just to monitor the grid, the contrast so that's why just look for the places where the negative stain is present and just move on so about the positive stain and negative stain so now let's move on the methodology of the negative stain so here what we have is a glow discharge carbon coated copper grid so all these concepts the carbon film copper grid and glow discharge were all discussed in, uh, in our earlier discussion and for those who want they can just look at the um, presentation on the um, em grids and support films so there we have detailed discussion about the glow discharge carbon grid let me just give you a fresh um, a quick um, information about this a glow discharge copper grid will have the carbon um, nullified hydrophobic effect of the carbon coating and thereby acts like a magnet so this glow discharge carbon grid should be fresh and should be used um, immediately after doing the glow discharging because being like a magnetic in nature this is prone for attracting any dust particles present that is on the way so that means it has to be protected at most before between the glow discharging and doing the staining process so what exactly the staining process consists it will have like a three droplets maybe typically of the order of like a um, few mi microliters what i do is i will take like a 10 microliters of each of these so just spread all these droplets in a parafilm and you know that parafilm is hydrophobic again there is a potential chance of the droplets rolling on one on the top so what we do is we make the wells of e on the parafilm and these droplets will be just kept in the wells so the first droplet will have your sample the micromolecule macromolecular sample and then you will have the wash it is an optional stage this wash is meant for removing the unabsorbed sample and then once wash is done it will be taken on to the stain molecule so this is the sequence the uh, grid will be just placed on the sample of course the grid um, after glow discharge will be placed on the sample and once this is done it will be blotted and before the sample gets quick dry completely quickly it will be just moved on to the wash so remember while moving from the sample to the blot and to the wash the sample should not be dried completely 
and after the wash again the same step will be reported so repeated so that means the uh, wash will be blotted out and before completely blotting out it has to be placed on the stain so once the stain molecule maybe you can just leave it for um, the time periods that i am just suggesting 20 seconds 5 seconds and 20 seconds and once this is stained after 20 seconds you can just leave it for a dry this is the uh, things in action so just to keep it on the sample and then move on to the blot very quickly come back to the wash and then move on to the blot very quickly come back to the stain and then move on then just let it stay for the um, drying for about like five minutes and then take it to the electron microscope experiment so here is one precaution that i have to just suggest you the longer that you keep on the sample will cause the aggregation or the more dense of the sample molecules stick onto the surface of the um, copper grid the less means the uh, poor uh, molecules so that depends on the concentration that you are started with if your protein is concentrated enough a small interaction or the time of the um, sample is enough if the sample is um, more concentrated um, less concentrated a relatively longer time can be used here so this 20 seconds is only an option of the suggested one that you have to just decide on the concentration of the protein that you are seeing and also the effect of the glow discharge I remember the glow discharge the effect of the glow discharge decays over time very quickly so that means immediately after glow discharge the um, um, the grid will be more effective after a while let us say um, if you've done the glow discharge and using the grid for um, staining after 30 minutes or 45 minutes the effectiveness of the grid is less so that means keeping um, a longer time is um, a required phenomena here so this all depends on uh, several factors that you have to use um, on your judgment so once the sample is done the as i said wash is optional and then the stain again i am suggesting at 20 seconds of the stain molecule um, again you have to just use your experience here the longer exposure may result in a positive staining a lesser exposure will result in no staining at all so that means you have to just keep a balance between um, the longer exposure and a shorter exposure keep in mind the longer exposure has a better chance of getting giving you a positive stain and a long lesser exposure will give you a positive of no stain at all so that means these are the various steps involved this let us see the things action um, one more time the glow discharge going back to the sample sample just goes back and just blots it and come back to the wash and again goes back and then come back to the stain and then goes back to the drying and after drying we will take it for the electron microscope experiment so remember again the dry um, has to be done it's only said like five minutes but what i suggest is just to leave it dry for overnight because the this grid has to be entered into the electron microscope experiment and that should be completely free from the um, water molecule so that means at this stage it has to be dried completely remember this has to be dried after the staining not in between the sample to wash and wash to the stain so that's um, a brief outline of the negative staining and next class we will discuss about what are the features of the negative stain and what are the strengths what are the weaknesses and how exactly this looks like and then we will talk about the cryo em thank you very much